Hey, welcome back to the rendering episode. Uh, in this one, I'm going to talk about still renders and a brief animation. I'm not going to go crazy on this because there's lots of good videos on, on rendering animations, but I'd like to highlight some things that I do that I don't typically see other people do. So for the first part, for the still image, I want to render it in front of a background. So I've created a plane, and this plane has a shader on it. So we go to shader. And that shader has a picture of a valley. So it's this picture here. That uh, It's a picture I took in Virginia, Virginia mountains. And if we just look at that image, you can see it. That's what we got. So that's going to be our background. And the shader for it is simple. It's just the texture file that goes to an emission and then into the material output. And I use the emission because I want this background image to provide some lighting information, some color information to the model. So if you remember from a previous episode, I did this where I just stuck the airplane in front of the background without any consideration for where lighting was coming from, for the background colors. Um, and it's very obvious from this picture that the model is not part of this environment, right? There's no reflected the light coming off the bottom doesn't match. The light from the sky doesn't match. The direction of the light doesn't match. Nothing matches, and it clearly looks off. So there are a couple things we can do to try to avoid that. One thing is to have a background plate that emits light and gives some lighting to your, to your scene. And we're going to use an HDRI, but we're also using this as light. And one of the other things I use is this thing I call like a little lighting widget. And it's just a sphere with a mirror finish on top and a white disc around the edges. And if I change the... I'm going to change the HDRI in the scene to be something different here. Try that one. All right, so this is a sunnier day. This HDRI has bright sun, fewer clouds. And you can see that this tool gives us some information. It tells us where the sun is. It tells us where the shadow is. And if we look at it from the camera view, it tells us what our ground bounce light is going to be. So this, this HDRI clearly doesn't match this environment. i got white puffy clouds, strong sun, and a brown underside. So we're going to get brown reflected light on our model. Uh, the best thing to do would be to find an HDRI that matches your background scene. So I'm going to choose this one. It's a lot closer. Uh, we get kind of an overcast day with a green bottom. And if you need to adjust the sun direction, you can do that here inside the world shader on the z-axis for rotation if I move this. You can see how that moves the HDRI around. And I know that when I took this picture, the sun was somewhere over here behind my right shoulder. Uh, because this is a very overcast day, we don't have any strong shadows in the picture. If it was a really sunny day with no clouds, then we'd have harsh shadows on the ground. Um, and it would be more important where this sun was. But in this case, it's not that big a deal because it's overcast. So that, that, that solves some of our problem. We got the lighting set up. We got basic bounce light set up. But there's something else we can do to try to improve this. If I take this background image and I duplicate it and I rotate it on the y-axis and I just drive it back a little bit so that the ground kind of matches up with this plane. So you can see what I'm doing there. I'm going to move it down. And then I want to go into edit mode and I want to put an edge loop right about where the two meet. It doesn't have to be super precise. And I'm just going to stretch this out here until it goes to about where the camera is. And now if we look through the camera, we move this up, maybe to there, you can see that the reflection in the bottom of the, screen, of the sphere matches our background environment. Now obviously to make it, we need to stretch it out. So I want to stretch it on the y-axis to be you know, much larger so that it you know, goes further out. And since we're not rendering something that's a mirror finish, I don't care about this stuff here, if I was more interested in, in absolute precision, I would clean up this bottom image so I didn't have this, this white stuff here on the edges, but I'm not super worried about it because we're really just looking for, for the majority of the light that bounces off the ground to match our background scene. Now, the other thing we want to do is we want to go over here to Object Properties, go to Ray Visibility, and we want to click on this camera. And that's going to hide it from our scene, or from our camera, but you can see that it's still reflected in the mirror. So when we have our, our vehicle in here, the light coming off and bouncing off this ground is still going to give that green tint to the bottom of the airplane and help it blend with the background sun. So we've got all our blending elements in ground, sky, HDRI, and we've got this kind of hidden off to the side. All right, the next thing I think I want to do is I want to put a cloud into our scene. 
just to add some something interesting. So let me turn off my widgets and this stuff. And if I go back to our camera view, um, I've already created a quote unquote cloud. I'm using I'm going to be using volumetrics. So if we look at our cloud here, it's really nothing more than a bunch of spheres. And I've got a subdivision surface on it, which is just going to smooth it out. And I have a displacement on it, which is connected to a texture. So if you go over to the texture button and you click on this drop down, I chose clouds, which gives me this guy. And then if you want to, you can use this color ramp down here to adjust how much you know mix of black and white and how hard they are. This is going to affect how the noise is then um, used to deform these clouds. So we go back to our modifier stack. So I've got the subdivision and I've got the displacement that runs through that cloud that I just showed you. And then when I turn on the cloud, you can see how that displaces our nodes. And it's on global. So that means if I move this through space, you can see it's going to change the shape of the cloud. So if you were animating the cloud, you know, it would kind of do that kind of thing. Or if you wanted to duplicate this and put this in different places, you would get different shapes slightly all over the place. So it's a way of kind of randomizing uh, your clouds. Uh, but that's really the basis for the, the cloud. So I'm going to put a cloud kind of right there. And obviously we can't render this because, you know, it's just a solid thing. What we really need to do is we need to create a volume empty. So I'm going to, I have one already from a previous test. I'm just going to delete that. So I'm going to create a volume empty. And that doesn't show up anywhere here. It shows up in your stack over here. I'm just going to move it into my clouds folder. And I'm going to add two modifiers to this. I'm going to create a mesh to volume, and I'm going to add a volume displace. The object is the cloud thing that we just made, those, you know, those spheres that we used to, to make the, basically it's the bounding box for the cloud, is what that is. And then within, here, within this modifier, you can also change the, um, the voxel amount. So higher number is going to be a more uh, detailed cloud. So I'm going to do 512 for right now, but when I do the render, I'll probably push it up to 1024 just to make it more interesting. So I'm going to hide the geometry, and that's that's our cloud so far. Um, and the other thing, this volume displace modifier lets you add extra noise to it to make it even more wispy. And I'm just going to reuse the same cloud displacement that I used for those spheres. And it's going to add a little bit more detail, and you can you know, change the strength of it. I'll push it up to one. And you can see how that just added just little bits of wispy stuff around the edges. Um, so we're going to have a little cloud in our background. That'll add some depth, um, give you a little bit of uh, parallax between the, uh, the airplane and the cloud and the background. And the next thing to do is really just to position the airplane. So I'm going to tie the cloud in the scene because I don't need to see it. Because it actually does take up a fair amount of um, resources. It's going to definitely slow your rendering down. If you do a cloud like this, using this volume, uh, your renders are going to be significantly longer. Um, but let's bring our airplane into the scene. And you know, from before, we've already had the propeller animated. So if I switch to my timeline and run this, you can see that the prop spins. And that's the only thing I've got really animated right now. And now I'm just going to move, I'm, I'm grabbing our box, our bounding box, and I'm going to move that to where I want it to be. And maybe hit RR to kind of give it an interesting angle. I already have the ailerons tipped, so it's going to be kind of towards us. Move it this way. Maybe move it a little bit closer to the camera. Something interesting. And um, make sure we have some motion blur on. Uh, fairly low. I've got it at 0.02, maybe, maybe 0.1. Um, just to make sure that prop is nicely spinning. And maybe I'll just move it a little bit more. All right, good enough. So we got our plane going through the air, we got a cloud, we're going to have a background. Let me kick off a render and we'll see how it looks. All right, I'm back sooner than I thought because I forgot to mention something about the clouds. So let me hide this for a second and hide the cloud geometry and talk about this cloud volume again because I forgot it has a shader on it and we want that, otherwise it doesn't show up when you render. So I go to the shader editor and I already have a volume on it. We'll just take a look at it. Go to object and a shader cloud all right so here's the cloud shader that i already created ahead of time um, otherwise it doesn't show up so texture coordinate generated some noise just run that through a color ramp and then if you crunch these two values together the more black you get into your color ramp 
um, the more holes you're going to have in your cloud. So it's going to create bigger black spots in your cloud, which is going to result in lower density. And then you can change the overall density of the volume with the multiply node. So I just kind of bumped it up a little bit. And then that just runs into the density value of the principled volume. And I just got that set to white. And everything else is default values. So yeah, I completely forgot about that. Um, so let me bring the plane back into the environment. And I'm going to actually move the plane a little closer to the camera. All right, we'll do that. I'll try it again. All right, you can tell that I uh, rearranged the scene a little bit more. I, I didn't like the, uh, the original arrangement with the plane flying to the side, so I just kind of turned it toward the front. The only other thing that I want to talk about uh, before I show you the final render is uh, it down here in passes, uh, I have the denoising data checked on so that in my compositor, if go to compositor, you can see how my compositor setup is the, if you click denoising data, it gives you this, these output nodes here, which then lets you create a denoising node, and then you connect it up the way I have it here. And what this lets you do is it lets you render your images with a lot lower sampling. So the image that I did was 50 samples, and the denoising function does a nice job of smoothing everything out. If I didn't have uh, the denoising on, I would have had to have a much higher sampling rate. So there's the final image. Uh, you can see that we got the bounce light here on the green. We've got our little cloud kind of sitting back there. It's subtle, but you know it's there. It adds something to it. A little bit of motion blur. Um, yeah. So that's it for the still render. I think I you know touched on the big pieces, uh, things that I do that are a little different. Uh, in the next half of this uh, tutorial, I'm going to talk about creating a uh, an animation, a quick animation. All right. I'll see you in that part. Well, here we are in the second half of the last episode uh, where we're going to animate our plane and kind of do a fly by the camera. Uh, to make things a little simpler, instead of moving this entire detailed model around, I'm going to actually just use our shrink wraps. I'm going to repurpose them so that we use those as a proxy. So you can see up here in my collections, I've moved, we had the shrinks from the previous lessons, you've seen those, and I moved everything else into this not shrinks category here, this collection. So I turn that off and I turn on our shrinks. I just have that base mesh model. And this has a lot fewer polygons, so it's going to be easier to move around, uh, faster to animate. And it's still connected to the handle, so when we move this and animate this, the underlying detailed model will follow with it. I already did a lot of the work in setting up the scene before starting this video. I didn't want to build it in front of you because I thought that would take too much time. Uh, so I'm going to kind of show it to you and then reverse engineer it and explain what I did um, so you get an idea of how it all works. So we have our base mesh there. I'm going to hide that and we're just going to talk about the environment first. So let me hide my plane. And in previous uh, renderings I've always used HDRI uh, renderings. In this one we're going to do it a different way. So I have here my shader. I'm in my shader editor. I'm going to go to world and you can see that I have this world set up here. Just zoom in so you can see it. Uh, we have a mapping node going off a of generated, going through a gradient texture through color ramp, and then we have a noise texture, a color ramp, going into a mix, and then going into this background node. And this is going to give us universal lighting in our scene. So if I go through and look at through the camera, I have a camera set up, and we render render this. There's nothing in the scene except our our universe, our environment. This is what this generates. So we're going to take a look at this in detail. There is a horizon gradient. Right, and that just you can't see it here because the gradient hasn't moved up. But if I put it through this color ramp, you can crush the blacks and whites. So basically, this is creating a a strong line here, and I've moved the orientation of it 90 degrees in the y-axis. Right, so that rotated it from a vertical line to a horizontal line, and then I moved it up in the x-axis. So if I move this up and down, you can see how this transitions that gradient vertically now after I've rotated it. And then the these sliders here allow you to either move or fade this gradient. So this is going to move it one way or the other. And then the white one is going to actually make it either stronger or sharper. So it's going to be a softer blend, it's going to be a harder blend. All right, this is going to form a mask. All right, so this is the mask, a horizon mask. This noise texture just generates this cloudy pattern. 
can adjust the size of your clouds. Here you can adjust the detail on them. They're going to get you know, really blobby if you go too small, but if you get some decent detail on them, roughness is going to add even more bits and pieces to it. So, you know, pick something you like, the size-wise. Make them as big or small as you need. Then this blue color ramp is what gives us the blue and white color, right? So this base color, you can have more or less clouds by sliding this. So you can change how cloudy your day is. And then moving this is going to make the clouds sharper or not. So we're going to keep that all the way to the right because we want them to be fairly soft. I might make them a little bigger though. All right, so this is like our really far away clouds. They're basically infinitely far away from, from our screen. And we combine that with this mask because I don't want the clouds to go all the way to the horizon. So if I change it to this, you can see how this black mask, when it's mixed with the blue color, uh, so this blue color ends up being down here, and then that mask just allows the clouds to come down to here and kind of fade out at the horizon. And then we put that into a background shader, and we get our sky. So this is actually going to provide light to our scene. It's going to provide this blue light to our scene. So that is, that is instead of an HDRI. It really only makes any sense when you're looking at the camera. If you're looking at it kind of in an environment, it's, it's hard to look at. But inside the, inside the, um, inside the camera, it works fine. All right, let's look at the next part of the environment. I wanted some additional clouds. So let me turn on my cloud dome. All right, so I created a sphere, a hemisphere, using the uh, quad sphere add-on. And on this, I have a very similar shader setup that I do to the background sky, where it uses noise and uh, a gradient to create this cloudy effect. If we look in the camera view, you know, we can see our clouds here. You might say, well, why do you have two of them? The reason I have two is because I want to create some depth in our clouds. So if I rotate this on the z-axis, you can see how those clouds are there. And if we're inside our camera, you can see how there's layers of clouds now. So when our plane is flying through the sky, there's going to be parallax between the close clouds and the faraway clouds, and it's, cause, it's going to give them a sense of depth. So basically the same setup we had before. We've got uh, you know, a mask that's going to create a horizontal gradient, and, and then a mask for the, the clouds themselves, like that. And then we mix them. Actually, I'm in the world view, sorry. But they're, they're basically the same. So we have an object. So we got a horizontal gradient, right? This is for the, uh, the dome clouds. And then the clouds themselves. This is another mask. And I say where those clouds are. Black is open sky. White is the clouds. And then I, the only really difference is this, this dome has this transparent node set up, which is then masked uh, out using this mask. So anything in this mask, this is the combination of these two. Anything that's black is going to be transparent. And it's going to allow us to see into the infinite space of our environment and anything that's white is going to be our clouds so that's the end result so we're this blue bit we're actually seeing off into space and the white bits are just the the clouds that are close by now i actually created two of these so i have two domes of clouds you can see how they're layered on top of each other and that's just going to give us extra depth in our rendering it's going to have closed as, as the plane flies through, you're going to see more and more parallax because we've got three layers of clouds. Um, just the ones here are fairly close, and the ones in our world environment are, are basically infinitely far away. All right, so that is it for our sky. Let's talk about our ground plane. So for the ground, I just created a disk. And it's always good to make your ground a disk as opposed to a square, because um, if you have a square, and you're looking at it through the camera, at some point when you rotate around, you're going to get to a corner. And then it's just going to look weird. Um, you're going to see that your world has a corner in it. So make your, make your ground plane circular. And to create this ground plane, uh, I started with a quad sphere. So you know, mesh, round cube, and then change to quad sphere. And I'm going to scale it up really big. Here. And then I just cut it in half. Scale it to zero, flat. And then in edit mode, if I select the outer ring, 
There we go. Hit Control I, and then um, right click Smooth Vertices, and then I can just repeat that by holding Shift R, and that just smooths everything out. You see how that gives us nice edge flow. Uh, it's better than creating just a circle um, and then scaling it down to to a point in the middle because you're going to get some weird topology in the middle. So that's how I created my my ground plane, and then on the ground plane itself. And obviously I have a texture, but I also have um, a subdivision modifier and a displacement uh, to create these bumps. So we're looking through the camera. I wanted some you know, slightly uneven terrain just to make things a little more interesting. And the way that works is uh, I create a displacement node. So you would create displacement. And then on that, under global coordinates, I created a texture. And the texture is just clouds. So you would select clouds. And then the size depends on... You know, how big your your pattern is so by default it's going to be something very small which is going to create a very bumpy surface i just wanted to kind of gentle rolling so i pumped it up there and then you can adjust the the strength of it by you know moving this slider so something something around 70 seems to work all right so that is the ground geometry but there's also a shader on here as well because we want it to look kind of like grass so i'm going to go into the top view i guess we'll take a look at it and for this, I do use uh, a free add-on from Andrew Price. It's called the Polygon Uber Mapping Node. And this allows you to uh, basically blend uh, tiles together, a seam, uh, texture, so that you don't see any repeating patterns. So let me show you what this looks like. Render this. So I have two textures in here. I have a dirt texture, which is this one, and I have a grassy texture. I'm going to disable my Uber Mapping Node for a second. So this is just by default. Um, I've unwrapped this and um, you know, just project from view so that if we look at the UV editor and you can see that I got it just projected inside the zero to one space. Go back to shader. And so by default, this is what the texture looked like you know, at one one space. Now by default, the rotation and the noise here are going to be zero. Um, and you can scale it up here. So I've got 10 repeats and you can see that it tiles, right? So even this is a seamless texture, you're still getting tiling. And the nice thing about this node is that if you change the rotation of the individual tiles, they blend together and you can add some, you can even add some noise in there to make things blend even more. So that, that tiling we had there for a second is all gone, right? So I will leave a link for this if you haven't already seen it. Andrew does a video on how to use it. Um, so I've got a dirt texture, I have a grass texture that uses the same thing, and then I have a color ramp and a noise that creates this black and white pattern that's used as a mask to mix the dirt and the grass. All right, so combine those two together, that gives us our dirt and grass. Look at it from the camera mode, we've got this kind of grassy, dirty feel, and then that just runs through a principal shader. Now I do use the output of the grass, and I run that through a color ramp, and I crunch that down to give me this black and white image. And I just use that to create a bump. It's kind of a, a quick way to create a bump map, just to give it a little more texture. It's not going to matter super much because this is going to be a video. We're going to have things flying past the camera. There's going to be motion blur. Uh, there's going to be trees and stuff. So it, it didn't have to be super detailed. You could put a particle system here if you wanted to go crazy, but you know, maybe that would be uh, too much. Right? We're trying to not create too much render times. Um, the next thing to talk about is uh, like a tree line. So I wanted some trees around the edges. So the first thing would be to create um, vertex groups to say where you want the trees. So on the outside edges, I have a vertex group called plants. And all I did was assign the outer rows to that. And I already have objects that I'm going to put on there. So let me hide this for a minute. And I will show you my placards that I use uh, for my trees. So these are just two-dimensional planes and they have alphas and, and images on them. And there are lots of videos out there on how to create planes like this. Uh, the nice thing about these is they don't have a lot of geometry and you can create fairly detailed images um, without a lot of expense because you know, there's only four points here and then everything that's in alpha is clear. So we're going to use these to create our forest as opposed to creating three-dimensional trees. Um, particularly not needed for a you know, an animation where we're going to be flying past stuff. No one's going to be looking at the individual leaves. All right. So we're going to use these as our part of, as the basis for our particle system. So we can turn that off. And 
Let's take a look at our ground again. All right, so here I have my ground plane, and you can see I already have some of these things turned on here in my particle system. So I've got my trees, I've got 70 on. We'll turn this up in a little bit when I talk about more of the settings later. In fact, what I want to do now is I want to go into my trees, and I'm going to turn off all of them but one, so we can just focus on one of them. And I'm going to turn on my camera because there is, there is a downside to using these trees in that they're well they're two dimensional. So if your camera is not looking at them from straight on, right? If your camera is looking at it from this direction, you're not going to see them. They're going to be just thin, right? Um, it only works. The illusion only works if you're looking at it head on like this. In order to um, make ensure that our camera is always looking in the right direction we can add a constraint or set of constraints to make sure that these always rotate and face the camera. So the first thing I want to do is I want to create an empty. Going to the top view, I'm going to create an empty. I'm going to plane axis and I'm going to make it bigger. And I'm going to move it directly behind my camera. And I'm going to parent it to the camera. All right. And for right now, let me move it actually back to the camera as a demonstration. And that seems to have moved into that collection. So I want to move it back to the scene. So yeah, the reason it was showing up everywhere is for whatever reason, Blender threw it into my deciduous trees collection. So it became part of the particle system. All right, so now it's back where it's kind of supposed to be. So if I move the camera, that empty is going to move with it. Now let's take a look at this one tree here. Now I already have a modifier or a constraint on it. So a locked track constraint. So you go add and then lock tracks. And then you want to pick a target. And I'm going to pick this empty as the target. You can see how that shifted these these planes a little bit. And they, they move. So if I toggle it on and off, you can see how they, they start to rotate. And the goal is to get them all to face the camera. And the problem is they're all the way around the camera. So you Basically, the camera is surrounded by these planes, so I, for whatever reason, the track constraint doesn't quite know what to do with this. But if I take this target of that constraint and I move it outside of the circle, you can see how they all lined up nicely. It's just as they're close to the middle, Blender doesn't really know what to do with it. But as long as this track constraint is directly behind the camera and outside this circle, then if I move the camera, these tree planes We'll always face toward the camera. And then when we look through the camera, we're always going to be looking at that alpha, you know, perpendicularly, right? So we're, not, we're never going to see the edge of any of these trees. All right, so that, that's, going to make sh that's going to make our rendering faster because we don't have to have particle systems with uh, lots and lots of polygons on them. So let me turn on all the other trees here. All right. And these all have the constraint on them, but they don't have a target. So what I can do is I can select these, active, make this one the active one, the one that we actually have a target on it, hit Control C, and then uh, copy object constraints. And then all of them will then have that target is the empty. And now you can see that all of our trees are pointing toward the camera, regardless of where the camera is pointing. So that's going to be important because we're going we're gonna to animate our camera to move. And as we move our camera, we always want those trees to be you know, perpendicular. Yeah, as long as we're here on the particle system, I might as well show you what I've got going here. Uh, we'll go back up to 7,000 trees. I've got object Y, we're on advanced in here, 7,000 trees. I want your orientation axis, at least for these, to be object Y. A little bit of randomization so that some of them are a little bigger or smaller. I'm rendering a collection. I've got my scale set up a little bit. And then I've got some randomness on the scale, so we have little bits of change there, too. Uh, we want to show the ground emitter, which is this, you know, circular plane. I am re I'm rendering my 2D deciduous trees collection, which is up here. So I'm rendering everything in that collection. And I've checked object rotation and object scale. These are important to use for this situation. And I have my vertex group set to plants, which is those two rings that went around the edges. So the next thing we need to think about is how do we get our plane to fly? Uh, the easiest way to make it fly a nice smooth path is to create a path. In fact, I'm going to hide the ground plane because we don't need to see that right now either. So shift A and then add curve 
path. I'm going to scale this up. And there's our path. And you can see we, if I go into edit mode, we have vertex vertices that we can move. And you can see these little arrows to tell us which direction the path is going. So the path starts here and goes that way. If you don't see the arrows, go over here and check the normals. This is going to see how big they are. Sometimes it's a small value, or perhaps you don't even have it checked. All right, so you got to have it checked, and then you can scale it up and down so you can see the direction of the path. And at this point, you would just move your path to any direction you like um, to create the flight path for your, for your model. And then we would go into the model itself. So I'm in object mode. I select our, our handle that we use. Right? So it's going to move our model. And I want to add another constraint to this. And I'm going to add a, a track to constraint. Or I'm sorry, a follow path constraint. So follow path. And we have to choose the path. I'm going to choose this one. Now it's important when you choose the path that your model is at the origin. If your model is somewhere else and you attach it, notice it didn't go here. It went somewhere else because there's a, there's an offset. So in order to be to avoid that frustration, make sure you hit Alt G on your keyboard, maybe even Alt R to make sure you're Alt G will snap it to the center, right? So if you're off to the side and I hit Alt G it'll move to the center, and if I hit Alt-R, it snaps it back in rotation. Make sure your object is at the origin before you actually attach it to the path, otherwise it's going to fly off somewhere you don't know where it's going to go. All right, next step, make sure you have follow curve turned on, and you can see that now our plane is lined up with our path, and if we look at the ax axes, you can see that, it, uh, make sure I'm on local, yeah, I'm on local. So they were on the Y axis. We just need to flip the direction of the Y so that it's facing the right direction so that the plane is now going to fly this way. Now, the plane actually isn't going to fly, so if I hit play, nothing happens. The reason nothing happens is we haven't animated this path yet. So the next thing you need to do is with the um, parented object, with the, you know, the, the control selected, go to the constraint, and then you need to click on this animate path button. Now if we hit play, Right, the, the object will fly along that plane. But you'll notice that once it gets to, to 100, weird things happen, right? It goes right off the path. Why is that? It's because you need to go into here and you need to change the number of frames. So we have 300 frames in our animation. I'm going to hit 300 to make it match. And now when we hit play, I'm just going to scrub ahead, get closer. It has actually scaled the animation so that it matches our timeline. So when it gets to the end, right, it goes right back to the beginning. So you got to do it in two places. You got to make sure your path animation is checked. You got to make sure your frames here matches the number of frames in your animation, and then that'll rescale your path to fit that. Now I have already created a path that I like for my uh, for this demonstration, so I'm just going to delete this one um, because I don't want to spend the time fiddling with it to make it something I've already made. So here's my flight path here, but it's exactly the same thing. It's already been animated, um, and I'm just going to take my model, and I'm going to switch the uh, follow path constraint to be this path that I created before, and I've already animated the path, so that if I hit play, it's going to follow that as well. All right. Now it's upside down, you notice. So if we hit RYY 180, it's going to rotate it around, so at least the plane is right side up now. Okay, the next thing to do is to have our camera track this airplane. Now we could, if we wanted to, add a constraint and use a track to constraint from the camera. And then if we click on our box there, if we look through the camera and we play the animation, it's going to track it perfectly. The camera is going to be locked in on that plane uh, as it moves along the path. The problem is it's very mechanical. There's nothing organic about it. All right, so I don't want to do that. I actually want to do something. I want to do this manually as if I, as if I was holding um, you know, a camcorder or a phone while I'm watching this plane fly. Now, before I actually animate anything, I do want to add an empty here. So I'm going to move my cursor here, and I'm going to add an, an empty. Plane axis, make it bigger. And I'm going to call this empty uh, focal or uh, focus point. All right, we're going to use this to adjust the 
uh, focus of the camera as the plane flies. So when the plane's animating, we're going to track it by hand. We're going to zoom in and out on it. And we're and as we zoom in and out, we're going to change the focus of it. Now we want this basically to follow along with this object here. So we're going to parent it to that. And because this is the actual thing that's tracked, our new empty will go along with that, follows along with that. Now if we look at our camera, and I'm just going to swing the camera around until I, until the airplane is kind of just out of frame. And this is going to be our beginning position. So I just want to make sure that everything is keyframed, uh, kind of basically as a, a baseline here. So for the camera itself, I want to make sure that I've keyframed my location and I want to keyframe my focal length. I want to add a depth of field. So you want to make sure depth of field is checked. And we're going to choose that empty. So now the focus point, that empty that we created, is going to be where the camera is focusing. And later on, if we move that focus point, it's going to change the focus of the camera. It's going to either blur or sharpen our image. I also want to set my location and my rotation on my plane for the initial position. All right, so now I'm ready to start running the animation and manually moving my camera. So I'm going to move the animation to maybe there. And let's hit I. I. And maybe, you know what, maybe I'll hit R, Y, Y, have it bank a little bit too. Just add some motion. Now I'm going to move my camera and I'm going to try to get it somewhat centered, but I'm going to be a little sloppy. I, don't, I want it to be a little off. I want a little camera shake. So I'm going to move my camera. And if I select my camera and I want to keyframe my uh, focal length because I don't want it to zoom in quite yet. I want to keyframe my location and I want to keyframe my uh, location and rotation of my focal point. Because right, we're going to be changing those in the next couple frames. So I'm going to move a little bit this way. And I'm going to move the camera a little bit more. And now I'm going to keyframe my camera. Or keyframe, that's keyframing the airplane, sorry. Select the camera. I'm going to keyframe the rotation of my camera. But now I'm going to zoom in. I'm going to zoom in. And I'm going to take this, and if we look at the top view, you can see that the uh, our empty is there. If we move it way over here, you know, let me let me first show you what this looks like. So, just a quick render. I'm going to hide this, and we're going to turn on our detailed model, and just do a quick render and see what this looks like in focus. All right, so that's focused. Now if we go in the top view here, and if I take that focus empty, now I'm gonna move it really close to the camera. You can see what happens. See how it gets blurry? All right, so we're gonna just move it out of focus a little bit, and we're gonna keyframe that location, and we're gonna move it a little bit forward on our timeline, and I don't need to be rendering. And we're going to move our camera back to our plane. And we want to move our focal point back to our plane because now we want to be in focus. All right, so we want to keyframe that. I want to make sure I keyframe my camera itself. I keyframe my camera. Maybe zoom out a little bit because maybe we're a little too close. I'm going to keyframe my airplane in its position here. Just so everything locks together. All right, so let's move forward a little bit more. All right, so go forward a little bit. All right, clearly too close. So let's uh, go to our camera. And I want to zoom out. All right, so we're going to hit keyframe there. I'm going to maybe move my camera there, hit keyframe there. And let's move our focus point a little bit again. So I'm going to just keyframe it where it is. Let's keyframe our airplane. Maybe go a little bit forward. That's too much. Go back in the top view, keyframe our airplane. 
I'm going to move my focal point into the camera. Just going to give it a quick out of focus for a second. Go back to our camera, keyframe our camera, move a few frames, move our camera. I'm going to go back up and I'm going to move my focal point back in because I want the camera to quickly go back into focus. So make sure I focus my camera, keyframe my airplane, keyframe my camera. All right, and I'm just going to pause this and I'm going to do this for the, the rest of the, the flight path here. All right, so I animated it basically along that path, doing all those adjustments that I was doing before. Um, so we just watch our animation here. You can see how it's it's not nearly as mechanical as it was before. There's a quick zoom. You can see the focus going in and out. The plane gets close. Now we got the focus kind of wandering a bit there. Hopefully give it a little bit uh, more realistic type of handheld look. And then the plane just goes out of sight on the end. I do want to add another thing to the end, or at least the yeah toward the end of the video. Uh, maybe once it starts to go past us, I want to have it do like a point roll. So I'm going to mark its rotation here as a key point. Let's make this at an even point. We'll just move it to 180. So 180 is where we're going to lock in our basic roll here. Right, that's our wing position here, and we'll go maybe 10 frames, maybe 20 frames. So I'm doing 30 frames a second. Um, all right, so 20 frames. Going to hit R Y Y R. Y, Y, 90, negative, put it 90 degrees, roll it, mark it, put it to 20, roll it another one, another 90, R, Y, Y, 90, negative, mark it to 40, R, Y, Y, 90, negative, all right, three quarters of the way around, and at the 260 mark, I actually want to do like R, Y, Y. Instead of 90 degrees, I want to do like 100 degrees. Because uh, you maybe hit over, over, over rolled a little bit. So we're going to maybe another, another five, maybe. R, five. Sorry. R, Y, Y, five, negative. So a little bit extra roll. Key it in. And then at 270, correct the roll a little bit back to horizontal. Then I'll just give it a little wiggle at the end of the of the roll. So he's going up, rolling. And it's a little too much camera wiggle. Now I'm going to move that camera. Try to keep him a little more centered. Go back to the keyframe there. So he's going to do his roll. Does his roll. Get the camera back on him a little bit. There we go. See how that looks. All right, rolling, rolling, rolling. Comes back, overcompensates a little bit, flattens back out, and then proceeds off screen. All right, so that's our animation. Do one last final run here to see how it's looking. Zoom in, plane flies past us. Zoom in a little more. You can see how that focal point tends to move a little bit. It's going to bring the plane out of focus. I don't like the way it jiggles there. Let's look at that. Like I have just too many camera movements here. So let's get rid of this one. See if that's smoother through there now. Yeah, I thought it was a little jerky there. Flying, does the roll. and then goes off screen. All right, that's our animation. So before we actually go and run an animation, you know, render it, it's probably a good idea to do a couple of still frames from it at different locations just to make sure that things look okay. Because um, it may look good here, but actually when you render it, maybe you got the plane flying through a tree, flying through the ground, you know, something like that. So pick a couple. Um, let's pick Maybe that one, and we'll turn on our. Well, we can leave this. They're on. They're going to be rendered when we render it. And I just want to make sure our ground plane 
particle system will render. So let's take a, I'm going to do a still render of this. All right, I did a couple of test renders of still images uh, just to make sure that things were lining up okay. So here we've got one where the plane's a little out of focus coming in. Uh, you can see how moving that focus point brings the plane back into focus. We've got you know motion blur in the back and there's another one the plane going past. The plane has got some motion blur on it, a little bit of out of focus, and then we got the back. Um, so I think it's time to kick off the animation, and um, that's certainly going to take a while to run because we've got 300 frames. Um, the way you want to do this, you want to make sure that in your output settings that you have picked some place for it to go. Right? I'm going to call it, you know, flyby one as my video. I've got a director that directory that it's going to get put into. All right? That's where that's going to go. I'm going to go. I'm going to output it as an FFmpeg video. I have my Sample set at 30, so this is a 30 with denoising on, so uh, we could go less if you wanted to save some time, but uh, I'm just going to let this run and see what happens. Uh, so we just want to kick it off, render, and then render animation. And then you'll see your, your render view pop up and it'll start to, to work. And I'm just going to stop the video here, or I'm just going to pause the video here and uh, I'll come back when this is done and we'll play the animation. All right, the uh, render animation finished. It took like seven hours, I think, on my machine and uh, I'll show you what it looks like. I did change the flight path. Or I changed the camera settings a little bit because originally the, the plane was pretty far away, but I, I moved it a little closer. So here's what we got. So I'm pretty happy with most of these elements. Certainly the clouds and sky came out pretty good. I like the plane. The trees could probably use some more work. The ground could use some more work. Um, but in the interest of uh, this series, I really was just talking about the animation. The obvious thing that's missing here is sound. So how are we going to add sound to this? Because we need to hear that engine. Let's start by opening up a new project and video editing. And I'm going to take that that video that I just showed you, and I've got another monitor here, I'm just going to drag that video onto my timeline here. And the first thing you want to do is you want to save it. I've had problems with Blender crashing here. So file, save as, and we'll call this ME109 video. All right, so this is just the video portion of it. Right, there's no sound to this. Now, what I have found is there are lots of places on YouTube where you can record, um, you know, flybys of aircraft or cars or trains or whatever. And I'll put links to some um, really good videos of one and nines doing flybys at air shows and museums and stuff like that. Um, I have already made a copy of one of those air show um, flybys, and I'm going to drag that video in here. And you can use whatever software you want to use to do that. I used OBS just to kind of, um, you know, record the sound as the, the video played. And when I bring that, this is the uh, recording from the, the, the actual 109 flying by. There's two pieces to this. There's the uh, video part, and then there's the actual audio. So we can go into our settings here. And I'm sorry, this is the, the like one is the audio. And you can say display waveform. And you can see this is going to be the engine sound. We don't need the video bit at all. So I can just hit X and delete that. I'm going to move this to the left. And if you look at the video, if you look at the waveform, you can see how it gets bigger here. This is where the plane is flying close by. So I'm just going to play it so you can hear what it sounds like. But obviously it's not timed well with our with our video here because the, the apex of the plane coming near the camera is right here where the noise gets bigger. So I want to move my video cursor to right about where the camp, the plane is as close as possible. And I'm going to move my audio to there. And I want to change the end of my timeline too. Right now we've got a 300 frame. Right, I want to change my frames to 300 so that you know, the end of my video matches the end of my clip. And now if we go back to the beginning and play it, so maybe maybe a little too soon. You know, maybe move it a little bit more. Uh, and you can certainly search for more videos here. Uh, 
get a better timing. I'm going to say it goes the other way. So now all we need to do is we just clip it. So I'm going to go to the very beginning and I'm going to select the audio and I hit K, make a hard cut. I'm going to the end of the video and make K, select it, hit K, hard cut, hit X. All right, at this point we just need to make sure we have our output directory set. So up here under output, I already have a 109 flyby final set as my output file. FFmpeg is the output version. And if I go to render, render animation, it's going to run pretty quickly because it's you know not doing the rendering like a frames. It's just mixing the audio and the visual together. It should take only a few seconds. All right, and that was it. Now if I go to my other screen and I open up the output from that render, this is what it looks like. All right, that is the end of the tutorial series. I hope you found it useful and I appreciate you watching. I will see you in the next series. Thank you.